Dr. Laura Lownan from Keene State College, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Illumina sequencing, um, which I also like to think of as the topic that makes my head explode, um, and I've become actually rather obsessed with trying to understand this very complex form of DNA sequencing. I'm going to start, um, this is going to be a two or possibly three part lecture series, um, and I'm going to start by just talking about DNA sequencing generally. So let's define DNA sequencing as the process whereby the identity and order of nucleotides in a DNA molecule are determined. So uh, I want you to know that the first sequencing actually was not of DNA, it was of protein. So the first protein sequencing method, arguably the very first one was invented by Per Edmund and it was called Edmund degradation. And then following that, other scientists, including Fred Sanger, um, developed new ways to determine the order and identity of amino acids in uh, chains or peptides. And Fred Sanger actually published the first complete sequence, which was the beta chain of insulin in 1952. Um, so that was the first, you know, bioinformatically important um, sequence of a biological macromolecule, and it was protein, and that was Sanger. Then RNA was sequenced. And um, that was the work of a group led by Holly, and a paper came out in 1968 where the first sequence of an RNA molecule, and it was a transfer RNA, it would transfer RNA molecule that carries alanine into the ribosome for translation, um, was sequenced. And that was, in fact, the first nucleic acid ever sequenced. So that happened in the 60s. And then in the 70s, the late 70s, Fred Sanger, as you can see, Fred Sanger was very important in developing sequencing technology for protein. He also worked on some RNA methods, and he invented the first DNA sequencing technology, and in his honor, it was named Sanger Sequencing. So it's been a long time since the 70s, um, so let's take a look at this quick timeline here. Um, 1953 was the year that the double helix structure was published. Watson and Crick published that. The 1950s were also when we had technology for sequencing proteins. Not shown in here is that in the 1960s is the RNA sequencing technology that I just mentioned. And then in 77, Sanger publishes the first DNA genome sequence. And it, it was a phage from, which is a virus that can infect the bacterium. So then, like just looking at a few other landmarks, in 1983, PCR was invented by Kerry Mullis. And that technique underlies all sequencing technology that we utilize today, which is why it's noted on this slide. This is the time span of the Human Genome Project, and when it began, it relied exclusively on Sanger sequencing, which is I'll cover again briefly here, and I've also talked about in other online lectures. In 1993, there was a methodology called pyro sequencing developed, and this is considered by many to be second-generation sequencing, where you consider Sanger sequencing to be first-generation. So not everybody uses that terminology, but you will see it here and there that, that pyro sequencing is second generation. Um, and that is a method where every time a nucleotide is added to a growing sequence, it's detected by the emission of light due to a chemical reaction that involves the, the um, pyrophosphate or phosphite phosphate group that's released when a nucleotide is incorporated into a growing strand of DNA. So there was additional technology, including something called single emulsion PCR, novel ways of doing PCR developed in the late 90s. And then this revolutionary company, Celexa, came into being, and we'll do more with that in a moment. But um, 454 Life Science really took pyro sequencing and, and made it really high quality. And then over time, in 2005 and 2006, that's when we got really good at using Selexa-based technology, which relies on solid state synthesis and a method called sequencing by synthesis. And this is considered by some to be next generation sequencing technology. It's also considered third generation. And that's really what the dominant form of sequencing is today. And the HiSeq machine, and today we actually have HiSeq 2500s and better machines. This only goes up to 2010. All of this is really Illumina-based platforms, which is what I will get to eventually. Before we can talk about sequencing, you need to have the basics of DNA replication under your belt. And so this is a figure that is showing a double-stranded DNA molecule as it would be found in a chromosome. And we've got two strands, and they are base paired together following the complementary base pairing rules, A's with T's and vice versa, G's with C's and vice versa. The orientations of these strands are not shown, 
But if this was the five prime end here, then on the other end of it would be the three prime end. And every strand can only base pair with something that is both complementary and anti-parallel. So if this is three prime, this has to be five prime, which makes this the three prime end of that blue strand. Now, what we see is when a chromosome is copied, both sides of the original molecule are used as template in order to produce new complementary DNA that is always grown by adding to the three prime end of the growing um, of the growing sequence that will be going into the replication fork on one side, away from the replication fork on the other side. So if we zoom in on this area here, we have these structures that are called replication forks. And these only exist in cells. This isn't something that happens in a test tube. It only happens in cells. So here's the original template molecule. And in blue are the template DNA sequences. In red is the new DNA being formed. One strand will be formed moving into the replication fork and one away from the replication fork. And the enzyme doing that is DNA polymerase, which is an enzyme whose major function is to catalyze the formation of the phosphodiester linkages that connect adjacent nucleotides in a single strand. So we know that lagging strand synthesis happens moving away from the, the replication fork, and it proceeds in short bursts that then have to be connected together with a series of cellular proteins doing their work. So in order to do DNA synthesis in a cell or out of a cell, you need to have the bases, which are called nucleoside triphosphate. You need to have magnesium, or the DNA polymerase won't work. You need to have DNA polymerase itself. And if it's in the cell, you need other proteins. If it's not in the cell, you do not need temperature to compensate for the lack of those other proteins. And you need something to copy, so you always need a template strand, okay? And the right environmental conditions, like the right buffers and uh, pH and so on. All right, so Sanger, back in 77, understood very well the chemistry of the nucleoside triphosphates. And so shown over here on the right is a normal nucleotide. This base could be adenine, cytosine, guanine, um, or thymine. That you don't know what it is from looking at it here. Here's the five carbon sugar, and this is one, two, three, four, five carbons. This is called the three prime carbon. It has a necessary and essential hydroxyl group attached to it. That's the location where we essentially plug on the next nucleotide during synthesis. So we always add from this direction as we're adding new nucleotides if we were creating a strand here. And DNA polymerase, in fact, can't work unless it has an overhanging hydroxyl group in which to add a new nucleotide. That's simply how DNA polymerases work, how all DNA synthesis in or out of a test tube works. Now, Sanger and his genius came up with the idea of building these artificial nucleotides called dideoxynucleotides, or DDNTPs. And in those, he took the hydroxyl group off this key position, and he replaced it with simply a hydrogen functional group. And that has the effect of stopping synthesis. So if this is the new strand that is growing, complementary to this template, then as soon as a dideoxynucleotide is incorporated, bam, synthesis stops. And so what? Well, what you can do is you can cleverly mix together a pool of dideoxy nucleosides, and you can fluorescently label them. Originally, when Sanger did this, they were labeled radioactively, but today we use fluorescent dyes because they're much safer. Okay? You, can, you can mix all this together, and you can also mix in normal nucleotides. And the concentration of the two is going to be really important in making a sequencing reaction work. You have to have a template molecule, you have to have magnesium, you have to have DNA polymerases, you need to have buffers, you need the nucleotides, the regular ones, and you need to have um, the dideoxynucleotides or chain terminator nucleotides as they're known as well. And you also need a sequencing primer because in a test tube, you don't have the enzyme primase to build a primer, so you have to add it in. So you put the primer in and it anneals to the template and then synthesis will continue in this direction. And as that synthesis continues, and you'll have like millions and millions of molecules of these, right? As the synthesis continues, normal nucleotides will be added in, and then periodically one of these dideoxynucleotides will be added in, and it will halt synthesis. And the result then is that after a period of time, you will have a mixture of fragments in your test tube, and they will have ends that are fluorescently labeled. And that fluorescent labeling will tell us 
what nucleotide is on the very end. Next, all we have to do is size separate. So we can take this mixture and we can run it through a capillary gel, um, which is like a flat gel but in a little tiny round column. And the little things will travel faster than the big things. And out they'll pop at the bottom. And so these, these will pop, this will pop out and we'll detect at the bottom with a laser beam and we'll see that that's a G. And then this will pop out, we'll see it's another G. This will pop out and we'll see that that's a T. Uh, um, this will pop out and we'll see that it's a C and so on. As these things pop out, we can read the intensity of light. We can mark it on a chromatogram or a ferrogram, these are called, and we can read the order of nucleotides that are present in this sequence um, as we move from one nucleotide to another. And that's the genius of Singer sequencing. So that's an introduction to what sequencing is, to who invented the first uh, first method, Fred Singer, and a quick, quick overview of the principles of, of DNA synthesis and Singer sequencing. Next, I'm going to move on to talking specifically about Illumina sequencing.